Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rowan Jacobs. I'm an engineer at Pivotal. I work on the uh, CF infrastructure team. And I'm going to be talking about uh, government certified IaaS regions, uh, how to get started using Cloud Foundry on them, and how 18F is doing that in production today. Hi there, I'm Brett Mogulewski. I'm the product lead for cloud.gov at 18F, and we have some experience with this. We were one of the earlier uh, adopters of Cloud Foundry in a government specific region, so we'll talk in more detail about that. All right, uh, we are required by Boston law to inform you the nearest exit is behind you in case of emergency. <laughs> We hope you know that by now, but if not, you know. We didn't rehearse that. It went pretty well. Though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. OK, so I'm going I'm to take over first. Um, and first thing to do is talk about, uh, I, I know a lot of you in the room are gubbies, but maybe some of you aren't and are interested in approaching this space. So we're going to take a quick nutshell tour through what compliance looks like at a very high level for the cloud. Um, and there are sort of three main bodies that you kind of need to be aware of. One is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, or NIST, uh, FedRAMP, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about the definition of, and DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency. Um, I guess I've got to be over here to advance slides, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Um, so first thing is that uh, most of the civilian government um, compliance, and, and actually you know, most of the compliance in general, is, is based around this thing called the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, or FISMA. Um, and what that does is it formalizes what are the steps necessary for a system to operate uh, and be part of an agency's mission for them to rely on it, uh, whether that's public facing, internal facing, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, the, the FISMA actually requires agencies to use this thing called NIST Risk Management Framework. And so this is a standardized sort of body of knowledge and practice around uh, the full life cycle of managing your, you know, your system. Um, it specifies a set of controls, which are essentially requirements, uh, in various families uh, relating to uh, access control and auditing and you know, all sorts of different things, including physical environment. Uh, and you have to select a set of those controls that apply to your system based on the, uh, what's called the risk level of your system. In other words, if this system was compromised, how much would it affect, how risky is it to the agency's mission? And some things may be different for different agencies. Maybe for some, you know, somebody in the DOD, maybe the uh, human resources system goes down. It's maybe not as critical as it, as it is if it happens for OPM, which is where it's central to their mission or something. So. It varies, it's, it, it leaves a lot of context to the agencies to figure this out. Um, and you have to kind of consider the, this combination of like, how confidential is this information? How bad would it be if the confidentiality was compromised? Uh, what is the uh, requirement for integrity of this information? What if the integrity was sullied? And the availability, what if the information was offline? You kind of rate in those three categories, you add it up and you take the high watermark and that gives you your FISMA rating, low, moderate, or high. Um, so that's kind of the critical first thing to understand is how you categorize systems. Uh, there's a little bit further that you go in the, in the DISA side for the DOD, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But this is a baseline, kind of how it works. Um, but to give you an idea, if you have a moderate system, there's about 325 controls. It goes up for, for high, I think it's like 425 or something like that. Uh, but basically, like, the majority of systems in government are probably moderate. 325 requirements. And again, they go anything from how far is your fire suppression located from the hardware to you know, uh, you know, your firmware updates, things like that. Uh, let's see, so forward. So this is a kind of over, overview. Uh, FIPS 189 is the process I was talking about where you kind of categorize your system. Then you have to select your controls. 853 is where all those controls are. If you look for NIST 800-53, you'll see all the different controls you might be required to do for government and all the compliance statements there. Um, you're gonna implement them. You're gonna assess them, and somebody else has to assess them, and then the person who's the authorizing official at the agency is gonna authorize your system, and then after that you go into what's called CONMON, or your monitoring of your controls. And you have to do that continuously, and then you have to redo it every year or so. So this is federal compliance in a nutshell, at least for the, for the civilian side. Um, and so that's the risk management framework. So everything else kind of stems from there, and FISMA basically says, hey, you gotta use this in your agency. Um, so then the question is, what happens with the cloud when you have, you know, that, that worked fine when agencies had full control over everything in their boundary. They had their own data centers, they managed all the machines, they racked everything. Now when you start going to providers, especially for CSPs, how do you handle that? So uh, the, the recognition is that every single agency is doing this separately and redundantly. So the Federal Risk, Assess, Risk and Authorization Management Program, FedRAMP, is gonna basically um, document which agencies have accepted the risk for different cloud service providers. And it's also gonna formalize a central sort of 
best of practice for, va for validating cloud service providers, and that means that agencies don't have to do that work again. They can basically take that work and do what's called leverage it. They can leverage that work and build on top of it. Um, the uh, Joint Authorization Board uh, is the uh, three CIOs of the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and the General Services Administration. So it's not just one agency making the determination, it's three. It means there's very, very high standards among them, a high level of scrutiny, a lot of communication. Um, and so once that authorization is done, then agencies can accept them. They accept the risk of using that CSP based on the sort of word of the FedRAMP authorization as a sort of a bit of social proof, but just like understanding what it represents in terms of the level of scrutiny applied. Um, and so that means that uh, if you use a CSP that has the FedRAMP authorization, you as an agency, when you build your information system on top of that, you have a lot fewer controls to deal with. If I'm building something in the cloud, I don't have a data center. I don't have, I don't know what the fire suppression systems is, but Amazon does, or Microsoft does, or Google does, or you know, any other cloud you want, I want to mention. So you're leveraging the work they've done there, and you're only worrying about the things that are, that are um, necessary for your application. But, uh, as I said, there are about 325 controls for a moderate system. A typical IS handles around 100 of them. So in order to go from that 100 that you get from just using a FedRAMPed IaaS provider to something closer to what you actually have to do for your full system, you, you really, is, you know, you saw the, the point in Peter's talk, a PaaS is kind of critical <laughs> to, to doing this and, not, and doing it once and having a huge economy of scale where you can have lots of applications on that platform uh, that are all leveraging you know, the, the stack of controls that have been implemented for them. Um, so Cloud Foundry is a great pick for that. Uh, it's why Cloud.gov uses it. Okay, so that was the civilian side. The DISA side, this is for the Department of Defense. Um, uh, DOD, as all these agencies kind of coalesce through, through DISA as the agency that sort of manages all the standards. Um, DISA uh, has what's called the Security Requirements Guide, or SRG, and it specifies levels. Uh, publicly, one through six, although I'm told there are more that are not publicly documented, I don't know. At least, I'm, actually, I haven't been told that. I'm assuming that because it says these are the only publicly documented levels in the documentation, <laughs> which implies that there are more. Um, the good news is that this SRG level two is, they, they've recently re recognizing that it was really hard for vendors to go through with both an agent, you know, a civilian agency and the DOD with totally different standards. DISA actually reformulated their entire standard to be based on top of FedRAMP. So now it's kind of FedRAMP equals or FedRAMP plus plus. So in our, in our case, uh, level two is equal to FedRAMP moderate. So cloud.gov, for example, has FedRAMP moderate, therefore we're DISA level two. Um, FedRAMP high uh, with a little bit extra is DISA level four. And then DISA level six is secret. And there, in the, doc, the documentation is really clear when, the, when you get the slides and look at this stuff, or if, or if you Google it, the documentation is really clear about how do you classify these levels and what is it you do. It, it builds on that same risk management framework as, as a base, but then it gives criteria for how do you determine what level something is. Um, and I think that's it for the, the nickel tour of compliance land. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You now know all you need to know to like tackle the federal market for compliance. So if you want it's, it's to, it's a lot harder than that. <laughs> if you want to start uh, using a public cloud IaaS, um, which is FedRAMP compliant or DISA compliant, there are right now only two you can choose from, which are AWS GovCloud and Azure Government. Um, sorry, GCP fans. Actually, um, actually, I should say, Amazon recently, the Amazon public cloud is also FedRAMPed but at a lower level. Yes. FedRAMP yes. moderate versus FedRAMP high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, FedRAMP high is AWS GovCloud only, FedRAMP moderate for other uh, AWS regions. Um, so AWS GovCloud is in many respects just like any other AWS region. It has its own endpoints for all the services. Um, the difference is it is only available to US persons. Um, it is available to all US persons, and you have a separate set of credentials that you use for your AWS GovCloud account versus your regular AWS account. So you today, if you are a US national or work at a US-based company, could sign up for a GovCloud account and start using it and messing around with it. Um, what's different about the capabilities of GovCloud? Uh, well, there are a couple things that are missing, and many more things that were missing until very recently. Um, Route 53 services, which is Amazon's own DNS services, are not available in um, AWS GovCloud. So you need to do your DNS management outside of AWS GovCloud, either on a vanilla AWS region or through some other provider. Um, up until, re oh, we also uh, do not have a Windows 2016 stem cell for AWS available yet. There are Windows 2012 R2 stem cells. Um, I believe the Windows 2016 stem cell is coming, but don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, what that means in practice is that if you're trying to put um, Cloud Foundry on AWS GovCloud and you're planning to support Windows, 
uh, you want to do the full .NET uh, framework, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble because you've got to build your own stem cells in there, yeah. and that's much more complex. Yeah, you will be limited to, your, your support will be limited for that experience. Um, there are many features which AWS GovCloud added recently this year, um, actually last month, including a third availability zone, which makes deploying Cloud Foundry much easier, um, as well as SSL termination on application load balancers, and um, they added network load balancers as well. So all of that is now available to you in the AWS GovCloud region, which brings it much closer to feature parity, especially for Cloud Foundry users, uh, towards what the vanilla AWS regions already have. Um, AWS GovCloud has several, um, you know, several compliance features, including FedRAMP High, DOD up to level five, although uh, at DISA level five, um, there are many services that are not available. Fortunately, the services that are, are available at DISA level five include most of the services you need to run Cloud Foundry. Um, there's PCI, HIPAA, and CJIS compliance uh, features available as well for people who have sensitive data uh, on AWS GovCloud. Um, Azure government is one that is only available to um, the US government and government contractors. There are four AWS government regions and two uh, AWS government DOD regions. Um, and AWS, uh, or sorry, Azure government is pretty similar to um, Azure in terms of features. The two main differences are you don't have all the same VM types available in Azure government regions. Um, this is a bunch of letters that probably don't mean anything to those of you who are not uh, Azure users, but what this basically means is you have a older version of the basic VM type, which is VM type D, and of the specialty VM types, you only have a few, um, which are the entry level for dev and test, that's A, the F, which is compute optimized, NC, which is GPU compute optimized, and H, which is your um, high performance computing, uh, high memory uh, VM type. Fortunately, a Cloud Foundry deployment will only use VM types that are in this range, um, so you don't have to worry. It doesn't use any of the more exotic VM types that are only available in these civilian targeted uh, Azure regions. The other uh, issue with Azure government and feature parity with regular Azure regions is that there are a couple um, Azure government regions which do not have managed disks, so you need to use storage accounts for any kind of persistent storage there, um, but you can avoid this just by choosing not to use those particular regions because they're, they're available in all the other regions, AWS, or sorry, all the other Azure government regions have them, so. Um, yeah, compliance is similar, FedRAMP high, uh, DISA uh, up to level five, um, PCI and CJS compliance, and those are also available in um, the, the, not the DISA and FedRAMP, but PCI, CJS, HIPAA, those compliance levels are all uh, available in um, vanilla Azure as well. Um, so if you don't need the full FedRAMP experience, you can also run on a regular Azure um, location. So let's say that you're sold on running a uh, Cloud Foundry on AWS GovCloud. I will show you how to do that in basically less than an hour of your time. Um, the team I'm on maintains a tool called Bosch Bootloader, or Bubble for short, spelled BBL. And what this tool does is it combines a set of opinionated Terraform templates um, with, um, with a set of opinions about Bosch deployment manifests and how to run a create end command and get up your first Bosch director. Um, so if you want to use this tool, you can just export your environment credentials as variables. We don't store these environment credentials on disk. Um, we just read them from the, your environment variables, um, which is a nice security feature. Um, you can run bubble up, and that will start the process of using Terraform to pave your infrastructure. It gives you a VPC. Then it will use Bosch Create Enf to create a jump box, which um, is the only part of this VPC that will have direct ingress from the internet. And then it will create a Bosch director, which can only be accessed from within that jump box that we just deployed. So your, your Bosch director will be inside the secure VPC, only available for you to use if you have the um, key that is generated for the jump box by Bubble. Um, so one of the problems with running this on AWS GovCloud is that um, AWS GovCloud, as I mentioned, does not have Route 53 services. So if you want to then put up a Cloud Foundry or a concourse environment on this, you need to manually configure some DNS. Um, here's an example of what Bubble would generate for you on a, um, on a vanilla AWS environment uh, using Route 53 
it's not that much. You can configure this DNS yourself. Um, you can create um, the star domain just points to the HTTPS router, the SSH domain points to the SSH proxy router, and the TCP domain points to the TCP router, and the uh, Bosch uh, dot domain just points directly to your jump box. So that should allow you to have a, um, you have a Bosch director, you have a jump box, and you have now your manual DNS config, and that gives you everything you need to download and use CF deployment, which for those of you unfamiliar with using CF deployment to uh, deploy Cloud Foundry, it's a much better experience than the legacy CF release. Um, and it gets regular security bumps in the form of stem cell bumps and other upgrades. Um, so I highly recommend that you use this if you're gonna deploy an open source Cloud Foundry. You can just git clone it and it comes with lo lots of ops files for you to use. I, I'll second this. We, we switched to it recently having had to work without it when CF deployment didn't exist. It was a lot harder. We had to maintain a lot more of our manifests. It's made our lives immeasurably easier for redeploying cloud.gov. Yeah, so CF deployment it works very nicely with a bubble created Bosch director. You only need to use one ops file, um, which is the operations slash aws.yaml. But if you don't like waiting like an hour for uh, Galera VM to compile, you can also use the um, uh, use compiled releases uh, .yaml, which is my favorite ops file in the CF deployment repo. Um, you will also need to provide a system domain, which will be your manually configured DNS domain um, from before. And this takes maybe like an hour or less to complete, and then you have a fully featured Cloud Foundry foundation on AWS GovCloud, and you can start pushing apps to it. So let's talk about how uh, 18F is doing this in production. Okay, so um, when we started, a lot of the things uh, that were crossed out were still crossed out, were, were still problems. Um, so a lot of what we've done in the past, we were ahead of the curve. Uh, Cloud Foundry had not been deployed in GovCloud a lot. We bumped our heads against a lot of stuff. We sent a lot of pull requests upstream. Um, the good news for you is that we don't have to go into exhaustive detail on that because it's all taken care of for you. Um, uh, but in general, what you need to know about cloud.gov, it is a US government tailored deployment of Cloud Foundry. We have a provisional ATO from the FedRAMP jab, which you now know what it means. They have a provisional authority to operate from the FedRAMP Joint Authorization Board. Um, and that means that agencies can use it with less effort than using uh, an IS directly. Um, we are 100% open source with one exception, which we're about to eliminate. Um, I won't name it. And uh, it predated the existence of the Bosch bootloader, so we didn't, we didn't have that to work with. We had to basically kind of nut it out on our own. Um, so the, the, the barrier to entry for, for running Cloud Foundry used to be, you know, if you're coming to this recently, three or four years ago, it was, it was pretty heinous. <laughs> it was pretty hard to get up and running. Uh, so we had, uh, we have basically, um, we run everything with Concourse. Uh, Concourse, uh, we have a boot, our, our bootstrap basically bootstraps Concourse, and Concourse runs everything else, and we control everything out of infrastructure as code. Um, it uses Terraform to set everything up at the infrastructure layer, uh, and then we have like different concourse environments for staging and production and our development and so on, and, and uh, everything is, everything's concourse driven. Concourse, if you're not using it yet, you should probably check it out. This learning curve is steep, kind of like Bosch, uh, or Bosch used to be anyway, and, but uh, concourse is really, is really pretty awesome with this. I should also mention that for those of you who want to get your concourse set up on AWS GovCloud, um, Bubble also has opinionated uh, templates for uh, running concourse as well. Right. And the concourse slash concourse deployment repo on GitHub is fairly new and fairly great for deploying concourse. Yeah, and I'll tell you that part of us getting through FedRAMP, I mean, it is, you know, it, it, we're making it sound very easy to get this up technically. Well, what's the value? It is pretty difficult to get through FedRAMP. Um, there's a huge amount of documentation that needs to be done. A lot of FedRAMP requirements are not simply technical requirements, they're process or team requirements. Um, I will say using Concourse was a huge leg up for us uh, in having really, really super aggressive CI, CD, part of our contingency plan, having everything in the environment as code. These things were sort of unconventional approaches. They were new to the FedRAMP auditors. But as has been mentioned in other, in other discussions, when you get the auditors used to this and, and show them that how you're meeting the requirement, which is you know, usually kind of written with like a change, change governance board in mind or something like that, but you say, no, we have peer reviewed pull requests and they're all hashed and Concourse only ever looks at hashes and look, I can see the hash in production is the same as the hash in version control. Like once you show them that, how a change gets into your system and, and deployed, you can actually get a lot of legwork done quickly that way. It, it, it serves a lot of existing requirements and process requirements. So definitely, definitely focus very, very heavily on CI, CD and replication from source. Uh, starting, you know, starting, starting as a contingency plan, like can I create the world including all of my processes for my team by pushing a button? 
Um, we, you can look at CG provision to see how we do it. It's not as easy as pushing a button uh, because we are still sort of factoring out all the steps. It, it, it used to be like 50 steps and now it's done to 20 and it's done to 15 this week or whatever. Um, a lot of it right now is just secrets management, which we're cleaning up. So you know, if you want to follow what we're doing, that's a, a, good, a good repository to check out. Um, but that is something where we're using as much friction as possible. We want, we want secrets rotation to basically happen constantly. Uh, and so we're headed that direction right now. And there's a bunch of other repositories that one will refer to that you'll see all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, so things we had to do that were workarounds on the commercial side, again, most of the stuff is, is crossed out. Uh, when we started, there were no stem cells provided for GovCloud. Uh, most of the people at Pivotal didn't have access. Um, we had to build our own, and so that took us down the rabbit hole of like, where do stem cells come from? Which is an interesting question, and you should totally check it out, because it's really interesting. Um, but you don't have to worry about it. Um, so we had to build our own stem cells. Um, the multiple listener capability on ALBs didn't exist, so we were restricted to only using the classic ELBs, which are uh, more expensive and harder to work with. Um, the NAT gateway capability wasn't in GovCloud yet, uh, which meant we had to run our own software NAT gateways, which we really didn't like. Um, it means you're responsible for another HA component that really is not adding a lot of value that you, you want to get out of your IaaS provider. Again, recently that was deployed, and we were happy to say, you know, that's one more thing we don't have to do that was special. Um, and limiting to only two AZs. So now we're at three AZs, and that, that helps with the HA story as well. Um, yeah, the, the default uh, CF deployment manifest does assume you have at least three AZs available at your disposal. Right. Um, there are some API differences and limitations between the GovCloud region and other regions. You would think that, that whatever is there is the same, but some of the things are not. Um, unfortunately, this means that when you work with tools that like Terraform, where all the other Amazon regions work this way, but GovCloud works a little bit differently, it's likely you might run into a bug. Um, we have hit our head on that a few times. The links here go to the different issues we found. Most of, the, most of them have been, uh, Terraform has been very responsive at fixing them. Uh, we've sent them patches whenever we could. Um, and again, it's gotten easier and easier. But just be forewarned that you might run into weird things, like, hey, Route 53 isn't around, so therefore this Terraform command doesn't work the way you, know, you might expect it to. Uh, let's see what's next. Okay, so as far as the FedRAMP, uh, um, I already hit this concourse point down at the bottom here, but as far as FedRAMP goes, um, the, we use the Bosch runtime config to basically handle, uh, FedRAMP is still very, in FISMA, is very, very focused on host security. Uh, and so they really want on your Diego cells and every other, every other cell in your, in your deployment, uh, they want you to have certain host security going on. So um, we do some hardening on top of what's already done uh, upstream in the project, which is pretty good. Uh, we do a little bit more to sp meet specific requirements the government says. Um, we deploy uh, Nessus Agent. Oops, there's the, uh, the one not open source piece. Um, Snort and Clam AV. Uh, you might use OSSEC or any of the other open source options instead. Um, and we have configured all of our log forwarding to go to CloudWatch to make sure we have a read-only archive, even though everything else is going through um, Logstash for, for Cloud Foundry. Sorry, not Logstash, Log, log Search for Cloud Foundry. Um, but everything else is still configured to mirror into CloudWatch so that we have, you know, for auditing and for um, incident response and things like that, we have an immutable, immutable archive. Um, and we are doing the Prometheus node exporter. Um, we are using the log, the Prometheus Cloud Foundry uh, project. We contribute pretty aggressively to that as well, which gives you all kinds of, you know, pre-built uh, alerting and monitoring for Cloud Foundry ready to go in Prometheus. Um, and again, these are sort of critical elements in our whole compliance story. Uh, it doesn't get you all the way there because then you have to actually document it in a million different ways and have it tested in a million different ways and then argue about it for a million different ways <laughs> and so on until eventually you get through. Um, but these are sort of critical things we did, uh, again, with vanilla open source Cloud Foundry. And if it wasn't, you know, we did not fork. Every place we possibly could, we contributed upstream PRs. So we've kind of broken, broken the path for you. Um, as far as services, uh, we're a small team and we don't want to be experts in every service we run. So if there's a, an AWS service that we can possibly broker, uh, we will. Um, we avoid uh, AWS specific services because we want to be able to use multiple uh, IaaS providers, we want to be able to use Azure and Google, and, and we don't want our customers to be inadvertently shackled to one IaaS provider. So we, 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 t we tend to focus on things that are like common standards. S3 is a de facto standard because everybody's got a blob store interface. Uh, so we, we kind of fudge on that one, but you know, for, for, for databases, we're sticking to Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, and SQL, SQL Server. And for um, 
you know, for other stuff that is not in Amazon, or if you're using it in Amazon, has Amazon specific pieces, we're running our own. So Redis, Elasticsearch, and Mongo. Um, we got Kubernetes going pretty early, uh, way before Kubo was announced. Um, we decided, hey, this is a really nice way to, uh, to run stuff. We used the original Docker broker, which was how people used to use Docker in, to provide services, which is like single container scalability in NHA, <laughs> uh, which was not great. Um, so we, at one point, said, okay, let's go figure this Kubernetes stuff out sooner rather than later. And uh, it was a net positive from what we were doing, and we're pretty happy with it. Um, so we run Redis Elasticsearch and Mongo there. If we want to run others, we can. If somebody has a Helm chart they want to bring to us, we can do that. Um, but in general, uh, if something is in, Am it, it is not Amazon specific, but is available through Amazon, and if it is in AWS's covered scope, which I'll talk about in a second, then we use that if we possibly can. We just, we don't want the operational hassle. If you made a Wardly map, like this is the commoditized part, we should not be in the business of doing that. We want to broker it, not run it if we can. Um, I said AWS has covered scope. Uh, this is one difference between Azure government and I think GCP's approach here. Um, for AWS, the FedRAMP boundary does not cover everything in AWS GovCloud. So first of all, you have to say, okay, is the service I want in AWS GovCloud? And then after that, you say, okay, now is it in their FedRAMP boundary? <laughs> Now, the good news is that Amazon's working really close, aggressively with FedRAMP to audit everything in there, and they're moving you know, services in, that's why some of those things had lines through them. Every couple months or three months, there's, there's another few services that kind of land in boundary. But you have to be kind of careful if you're doing something for FedRAMP or just so that, you know, GovCloud is not, you know, if you just say, well, I'm using GovCloud, that's not, a, that's not it. You know, you have to additionally look at the subset of, of GovCloud that is, in, that is in the FedRAMP authorization zone. Uh, that zone is expanding as more things get into it. So eventually, that'll be the same. Um, Azure took a different approach. Uh, they have fewer things in their government uh, region, but everything in there is also in their FedRAMP boundary. So things only, if it arrives in there at all, it's definitely FedRAMP. So you, that's something to keep in mind uh, as you approach these, these providers. Um, GCP, I think they're only going to have one region. I don't think they're going to split it up. So I don't know, I'm not actually sure how that's going to work out, but we're kind of interested in how they're going to handle that. Yeah, the, the GCP uh, as a government IaaS is like very much an emerging space. It's, it's an emerging uh, space, yeah. yeah. So it'll be, it'll be exciting to see what they do with it, but for, for the moment, I don't know of anyone running Cloud Foundry on that. Uh, in the government, you mean? In the government, yeah. Yeah, uh, be, because FedRAMP is like a, it's like a zipper. You gotta kind of zip from FedRAMP all the way up, and it's, it's FedRAMP turtles all the way down, right? So you can't build a FedRAMP service on non-FedRAMP components, or if you do, you have to like have ridiculous arguments about what's in and outside your boundary. Um, which we've done. Uh, we have to. We had to worry about RAF 53. That was actually a really big obstacle because we are using it. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a thing. Um, I'm not sure how. I, I've, I've heard this is not this is not because anybody's told me, but uh, it's, it's hearsay. Take it as, the, as that. I've heard that Google is going to ha not have a separate government region. That they'll actually get. They're going to try and accredit the whole public region. I don't know if that's going to be possible. I can't imagine it, but. Who knows? Good luck to Google. If Good luck. What it's pretty try, tough. Uh, it would be pretty amazing if they yeah. did that um, for a lot of reasons. Yep. A final word is that the US government is not the only government in the world uh, that is going cloud native. Um, there are, as for specific IS regions, there are specific uh, AWS regions for China, as well as specific Azure regions for Germany, although I do believe Azure Germany actually is available to all EU customers. Um, and also, for government customers outside the US, um, vanilla AWS regions offer a high level of compliance for Australian, German, Singaporean, and Spanish government standards, probably other government standards, but those are the ones that they did advertise. Um, and as for other organizations in other governments um, that are providing cloud-native services, including services using Cloud Foundry, the Government Digital Service in the UK, uh, the Digital Transformation Agency in Australia and the National Information Society Agency in South Korea are all providing uh, cloud native services based on Cloud Foundry to government organizations. And we should mention that in the Cloud Foundry Slack, uh, there is a HashGov channel where we actually hang out and occasionally swap PRs. Um, we contribute to each other's projects, we ask each other for how you're approaching this or that. They have totally different compliance regimes, but they tend to be similar in a lot of cases. Some of them, I, think, I believe Canada is not in there, but I believe Canada's uh, compliance regime also refers to the NIST risk management framework in FedRAMP. So um, if you are interested in Cloud Foundry as it relates to different governments, then that's definitely a channel to go check out. Absolutely. All right, any questions? All right, we have one question. Hang on, hang on. We're, re we're, we're, we're recording. We're gonna bring the mic to you. Yeah, we're recording, so let me bring the mic to you. You want an elevator? Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Um, for your developers, once you get this set up, is it, is, it, is it, can they just like kind of push, like do CF push and then you don't have to worry about anything else or is there stuff that the app developers have to worry about as well in terms of all the regulations? Yeah, so um, you can handle 100%. The, the actual FISMA rating um, where, you, where you say is it low, moderate, high, depends both on what the system is supposed to do and what kind of information is inside it as well as the technical implementation. So we can't do that for them. We can, you know, if this is, if, the way I put it is that if there's a mountain of, of, of compliance that you have to get over to get to production, we turn it into an iceberg and shove as much as we can down below the waterline. So there's a smaller bit that pokes up that is still their responsibility. So ultimately all we can do is reduce the number of controls they have to deal with or make it easier for them to comply with the controls that are still on their side. But they might, it, it depends on what their app does. It might also depend on, on their authorizing official at their agency, their CISO or their CIO. Um, that person might have a very specific need based on that agency's mission that is not covered by what we do, but they want every team to worry about. So we can't, we can't give out ATOs. We, we have what's called a provisional ATO, which means you know, the agency has made provisions you know, for your journey. Here we've provisioned this platform and we authorize everything below this, but you're still gonna have to get an authorization for the part above. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, provisional doesn't mean like it's temporary, it's provision like a quartermaster for the journey, you know, kind of thing. Hey, yeah, uh, so I was curious about how you're handling credentials for um, AWS specific services within the platform. Uh, we are just now rolling out CredHub because that, again, we predate CredHub by quite a lot. Um, but, uh, oh, are you talking about the actual like infrastructure level or your to apps? No, for example, if you, uh, you're saying you're using S3, so if yeah. you, an application running on Cloud Foundry is using S3, how are you passing credentials from the IS level to the container? Yeah, uh, so if we have a broker that's gonna um, provision an S3 bucket, it's still gonna give you the four kind of credential pieces you need. And if you look at them, yes, they will say AWS dot blah, 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 blah in the domain name. But in terms of how your code would treat them, it doesn't care. Are Same thing for Postgres, like we're gonna just give you a PGSQL colon slash slash user colon password at host, right? Are you using static credentials or have you looked at No, no, no. Um, no, the broker uh, sets up a new credential for every bind. Uh, what, there, we, I should say that one of our brokers doesn't set it up for every bind. It has a shared for each instance. Uh, all of our others, they, and we're going to fix that one. Uh, all the others, they do a, a new credential for every single bind. So if I, if I have a credential that's compromised in an app, all I do is unbind and rebind. And I got a new, it, it automatically provisions a new user in the database or whatever for that. So instances correspond to the actual database deployment and then like binds correspond to individual user credentials. So each, each of your apps has a different credential to that same service instance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you. High five. Woo! Woo!